you turn to Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, we'll be picking up in Acts chapter 9 this evening. Uh, we concluded chapter 8 on uh, Sunday morning, picking up at the start of Acts chapter 9 uh, this evening for our uh, Bible, uh, Bible study. Excuse me, before we get into Acts chapter 9, we're going to look at our outline of uh, the book of Acts that we are uh, following. And we divided the book down into two major sections. We've got the gospel in Palestine in 1 through 12, and the gospel to the uttermost or the ends of uh, the world in 13 through 28. Uh, we're still in section 1 on the gospel in Palestine, but we noted that that section uh, is divided down into two other uh, subsections. In uh, 1 through 7, we have the gospel in Jerusalem. So that's the work where we have the, the church established in Acts 2. Uh, that's the section where we've got that early what's going on, where Ananias and Sapphira take place, the persecution, the stoning of Stephen, the appointing of the seven men. All that takes place in Jerusalem. But when we opened up in chapter 8 last week, what was taking place? What, what's happening at the beginning of chapter 8? Following the events of Stephen's stoning in chapter 8. Saul's persecuting the church. He's wreaking havoc on the church. And so because of that, uh, what happened to the Christians there in Acts chapter 8? Where do they go? Or what do they do when the persecution picks up? They disperse. But when they disperse, they don't stop practicing and teaching. Instead, they go out and continue to teach the gospel. Uh, we follow in particular in chapter 8, one evangelist who we uh, know four stories of. Don't know a whole lot about him, but we know we've seen him four times. Uh, and that's Philip. We see in chapter 6 that he's one of the seven men along with Stephen. We see in chapter 8 that he goes into what area? Samaria. And he begins to the Samaritans. And then after going into Samaria there, uh, he converts not only the Samaritans, he converts uh, the first man is converted there and follows with him. Then chapter 8 ends with the third story, that is the conversion of the eunuch. And then we don't hear of him again until chapter 21, when uh, then Paul, Saul of Tarsus, then known as the Apostle Paul, enters into the house of Philip in chapter 21 as he's getting ready to journey back towards uh, Jerusalem. It's there which prophesied that he'll be so, uh, Paul will be taken captive, and they try to lead him not to go in Acts chapter 21. So Philip goes out. In particular, he's the one we follow in some of the work he's doing in the teaching of Samaria, and in the teaching that takes place there in, uh, to the Ethiopian eunuch. So, we remember this uh, subsection into these two. There's the gospel in Jerusalem 1-7, to and then we just remember 8-12 through as Judea and Samaria. That's the area where they're going to be taking place. Focused on the areas of Judea and Samaria in 1-12. Uh, through And in 13 is the uttermost parts of the world, because that begins the preaching journeys of Paul. We had looked at this before, uh, six panels of the book of Acts. I bring this back up because uh, our second panel is going to end, the, the sort of progress report sections. Our, our panel is going to end here in chapter 9 and in verse 31. Uh, real quickly, would somebody read verse 31 for us? So chapter 9. Then the church throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria gave peace, being built up, and going on the fear of the Lord again and the comfort of the Holy Spirit continued to increase. Okay, so we see here about the, the, the growth of the early church taking place here in Acts chapter 9, uh, as it's referenced there in verse 31. So this is that second panel. Now, these aren't our only progress. In fact, uh, go ahead, we'll skip uh, down a few. Question 6 here asks the question, what progress reports are given in this chapter? There are several things reported as progress. What were they in chapter, in chapter 9? What all, what all events for the growth of the church are taking place here? Skip question six. What are the progress reports of the chapter? What conversions do we see sort of as the progress reports? So who's the, who's the main conversion of the chapter? Chapter nine. Who's the first one? Saul. And then verse 31 that was just read for us, we see growth at the churches of uh, Galilee and Samaria. And then... Um, 
If you come down to 32 through 35, there's more that are being added to the Lord. And then after the raising of, of Dorcas or Tabitha, depending on your translation, uh, at the end of chapter 9, we have even more people uh, that are added to the Lord. So there's a lot of converting going on, a lot of people that are converted to the gospel here in chapter uh, chapter 9. So as I said, verse 31 is sort of our big progress report, but there are other reports even throughout this chapter, much less other ones. Chapter 8, we had two prog- or three progress reports. Samaria, uh, we had the report, the progress report on the growth with Simon and then with Ethiopian eunuch. So there are more reports than these, but these are sort of our, our, our bigger reports, if you will, that we can remember the division by. And so our second panel ends here in verse number uh, 30, chapter 9 and in verse 31. Let's get ready now for, uh, I don't know why in the world this laser won't stay still. Uh, let's get ready now to move into chapter 9. Uh, chapter 9 is coming down into uh, five different sections. And so the first one is 1 to 9. The Lord appears to Saul on the road to Damascus. Uh, The second is the conversion of Saul in 10 through 12. Saul goes to Jerusalem in 23 through 30. uh, uh, Or Saul's conversion, yeah, 23 through 30. The churches in Judea, uh, Galilee, and Samaria do well in verse 31. And then 23 through 43 is the two miracles recorded by Peter. There's a map here. We looked at this map on uh, the other day, and we noted on this map here that uh, that there's, if you notice up here in the far, uh, what will be your right-hand side on either one of the screens, there's this red arrow up in the corner. If I can get my laser pointer to cooperate, I'll show you where it's at. Uh, the top right-hand corner, there's this red uh, arrow that you'll see. That's the journey that Paul would have been taking towards Damascus. Damascus is up in that right-hand corner. That's where Paul was at the time that this persecution it's taking place right up in here at this red arrow. And this is where Saul is uh, headed. It's the journey of Saul. So that's where we're going to be. Damascus is this city right here, barely on the map, right below the, the 10-1 for the number of maps in the atlas that I found it in. So that's where we are at the, this time. Let's go ahead and go into chapter one, or chapter 9, verse 1, beginning now. The Lord appears to Saul on the road to uh, Damascus. The Lord appears to Saul on the road to uh, Damascus, beginning at verse 1. But Saul, breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked them for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are uh, to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he went without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now, Saul's on his way to Damascus in 1 through 2. Uh, one and two, to, to persecute the church. He's looking for letters according to verse one, uh, or uh, rather verse two, in the end of verse one, letters to go into the synagogues of Damascus and persecute those who believe in Christ. Come now to question number one in the book. Again, we skip down to six, so we'll skip six later on. Question one now, what does it mean to breathe out threats against uh, threats and murder? What is it that he's exactly that he's doing? Yes, that's exactly what it, what it means. Uh, the, the word there for he's breathing threats means to be thre- that, that it's with every breath. He's, he's threatening with every breath to kill Christians. That's, that's what Saul's doing at this time. So Saul is threatening to uh, Saul is threatening to uh, with every breath to, to persecute uh, Christians. And so that's what he's going to Damascus uh, to do. And as he's on his way to Damascus, there's this light that shines from heaven uh, on his way. And, and, and then this voice speaking to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Uh, if somebody has a new King James, could they read verse 4 and 5 for us? It reads a little bit differently. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord 
Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goat. Uh, so there he's given the illustration. The, the ESV, uh, we mentioned this before, New American Standard and others being critical text, opt for the shorter readings. And so some manuscripts exclude the kicking against the goat. So uh, thank you, Lonnie. That's why I had Lonnie read it, because it mentions there, it's not mentioned in the ESV, kicking against the goats. But the idea is, how long are you going to persecute me? How long are you going to persecute Christians? How long do you think you can do this before what's going to result? What's going to happen eventually to Saul if he keeps doing this? Well, nothing good, right, can come from this. He thinks he's doing right, but what's the ultimate punishment if he continues to kick against the goat? He's going to be lost. He's going to be condemned. And so the the point here is, how long are you going to continue to do this? How long can you kick against these goats? How long can you keep persecuting me or against me uh, when eventually it's going to come back to get you? That's why he's kicking against the goats, right? There's going to be pain that's eventually inflicted. How long can you continue to do this is the question he's asked. Yes. It's important, I believe, to realize that this is why you persecuted me. So by proxy, if we do good or bad as a Christian, it's like we're doing it to Christ. The judgment scene in Matthew chapter 25, those are going to go into the world, like I said, I was hungry, sick, naked, thirsty, uh, in prison, if you come and minister to me. They said, when did you see this? And he said, in as much as you did it to them. Okay, now, then he goes on to say, when you fail to do that, James 4, 17, those who know to do good to that, do it, that, that, that sin also. So he went on, and that for a picture of Tom Jackson said, you didn't do this, and he said, you're first in the way. It doesn't say they were going to be considered foul and ask for it. They just failed to do the good. Okay, now we hear this particular thing. just kind of makes the same point. He said, why are you persecuting me? It wasn't Jesus personally, but it was his people. And then you pose the question, what would have happened to him if he wouldn't have? If Paul would have suppressed the truth, Saul of Tarsus would have suppressed the truth. I was thinking about 2 Thessalonians. One start in verse 6. It says, Since a righteous thing will God be repaid with tribulation those who trouble you. And if yet you are troubled, you are rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. Most vengeful, those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if he wouldn't have obeyed, we know that it would have been flaming water by the fire of Saul of These shall be punished with everlasting from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes in that day to glorify the saints to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you is believed. So I think it's a sobering thing. If you're uh, one of God and I do you wrong, you know, when God's mm-hmm. going to repay you, you know, and Saul of Tarsus is going, of course, to hell, but then he held the boat for those that uh, stoned Stephen and him. Okay. What did he do? When he heard the gospel, he didn't suppress it, he obeyed it. But had he not, Second Thessalonians chapter 1 answers that. He was going to have flames and fire. Right, you know, I do think you raise a valid point, that, uh, a good point that's, that's made about the fact that he, he's persecuting Christians, but the point about him persecuting Christians is he's still in opposition, opposition to Christ. And, and that's an important thing uh, to realize, just like you pointed out, as pointed out in Matthew about you didn't do these into the, to these, you didn't do it unto me. That's how he's persecuting Christ, because Christ is already uh, at the right hand of God at this point. We know that Stephen saw him there, right? Not only the prophecy of, of Psalm 110 pointing to it, but Stephen said that he saw him standing at the right hand uh, of God. And, and so that's where Jesus is, but he's persecuting those and following him. And so you're right, that, that, that this is a good point. We need to understand that, that, that there are ways uh, in which we today can do things against others to which it is against Christ, even though he's not here that we're actually doing it uh, too. But if we do it against those who are serving him, yes. So the main church should be to love others and love ourselves. That should be the main church. But also on that, that, if we don't do it because we don't have sufficient love, like I read there in the second test, when it's going to be repaid with tribulation and flame and fire. You know, Paul said, I've been a prophet who has done my duty. He said, the Lord will bring Somebody does do you wrong, it's not up to me to retaliate against that person. Paul said, Be reviled. He didn't revile back. You know what I mean? So Mm -hmm. all these things are points that need to form our hearts so that we treat people well. Right, right. We need to go back to that principle of Matthew chapter 7 about the golden rule. Uh, You know, I think sometimes even as adults, we remember it how kids say it. And that is, do unto others 
what they do on us, not as we would have them do unto us. And so, you know, I think sometimes that's said as kids and we sort of laugh like, hey, this is what it really is. Like kids get it wrong. But sometimes as adults, we live out the same principle that as kids was sometimes mis- uh, misremembered in that principle of the golden rule. Coming back now to chapter nine, question number two. Uh, this is important. The Lord appears here to Saul in 3 through 6, and then Saul sent to Damascus in verse 7. But why does the Lord have to appear? There are two reasons. Why does the Lord have to appear to Saul of Tarsus? For him to be an apostle. The other is that he's eventually going to send him to who? And is this why when Saul is converted, who's Saul eventually going to be used for, for teaching? The Gentiles. And so he appears to him here, to, one, he's going to send to the Gentiles, and then to qualify him as an apostle. Real quick, Acts chapter 1 and in verse 22. Keep your finger here in chapter 9. Uh, but remember in Acts chapter 1 and in verse 22, this is the selection of Matthias, the replacement of Judas. Uh, beginning with the baptism of John into the day when he was taken up from us, and one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And we know that Saul sees him here, and then Saul points out, or Paul, rather, later on, points out in 1 Corinthians 15 and in verse 8, uh, the last of all is one untimely born. He appeared also to me, for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle. So he appears here, which qualifies him to be an apostle. That's why I remember him as the apostle Paul. He's qualified now uh, as an apostle, having seen Jesus after his, uh, (coughs) excuse me, after his, Resurrection. Now, let's come into 10 through 22. 10 through 22 is the, con- the actual conversion of Saul. 1 through 9 is the Lord appearing to him. Let's read 10 through 22, uh, and then we'll come back and discuss this section as well. Now, there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go out to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house. And laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he arose and was baptized. And taking food, he was strengthened. Some days he went with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priest? But Saul increased all the more in strength, and confounded the the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. So picking up in verse 10, uh, the Lord comes and tells Ananias to go to Saul. Uh, So he tells this this man, Ananias, he says, you know, Ananias, you need to go uh, to Saul or to the house of Judas at the street called Straight. And there's a man from Tarsus named Saul. Now, what's Ananias' original reaction? He's scared. He knows. Wait a minute. I, I know who this man is. Right? I, I know who he is. This is a man, he points out, uh, coming down. Uh, Lord, I have heard about this man, verse 13, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. Okay, so I want you to think for just a second about back into chapter 7. Where do we find him in chapter 7? Two, two things we find about him. One at the end of 7 and the first of 8 when it comes to Stephen. What two things did he do with Stephen's death? One, he... Consented to it, and two, he held the garments of those who stoned him. He wasn't the one that actually cast the stones, but he consented to it, and he held the garments. Uh, As a side note, a quick lesson we can learn, just because we don't uh, do the sin with somebody doesn't mean we're not partakers in it if we approve of it. That's exactly what Saul did there in in Acts chapter 8, or 7 and 8. Now, not only is he cast his vote and, and consent to the death of Stephen, not only does he hold the coats, let's go into chapter 8 now. 
Who's the one wreaking havoc on the church, according to chapter 8? Saul. We come into chapter 9. Who's the one that's going to Damascus for letters from the high priest to take away Christians? It's Saul. Right? So he's done a lot of damage to the church. And now Ananias is told by the Lord, go to Saul. I don't wonder Ananias is hesitant at first. Do you think you'd be hesitant if you were in Ananias' position? I thought like, like the psalm of them lost what is it on the New Testament? He came down and said, sat behind me in our services. Ah, I got to write my bed early. You know what I mean? We could equate a man, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But he was responsible for the Lord. You know, so I think sometimes we kind of put ourselves in a similar situation. We'd be in the same way. Right, and I, and I think we all would have been like Ananias. What? Are you sure about this? But the Lord tells him, as we mentioned earlier, he's a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. So I just want you to think for just a second. Okay, first of all, Ananias was told that Saul was going to take the name to the Gentiles. Do you know how many non-Jewish proselytes have been converted or non-Jews have been converted to this point? Zero. Where's the first one take place? Cornelius, that's, that's still a chapter away, right? We're still not to chapter 10 yet where that takes place. So Ananias is already told that Saul's going to take the name to the Gentiles. Not only that, he's going to take his name before kings. Remember how when he's in prison, he preaches and teaches before the household of Caesar? And then he's going to take it to the children of Israel. Where is the first place Paul or Saul goes every time he enters a city? Where's the first place he goes? To the Jewish synagogue. So where does he take the name, or preach the name of Jesus? To the Gentiles. Before kings and to the children of Israel. That's exactly what the Lord said would take place. Some people, and I think it's worth noting there, I, I didn't bring my Bible with me, I didn't bring it with me, but in the notes that I have, I don't know if it's in there. But in verse 17, for Ananias addresses him, brother Saul, mm-hmm. but yet he hadn't been baptized. We know that the majority of the religious world says that Paul was saved from the Romans, and that's what Saul was saved mm-hmm. later. He calls him brother Saul, but my understanding is they were Jewish brethren. And then, like, you know, one of the, I can't remember what it said, it says, men and brethren, let me speak for you. Mm-hmm. So that term was used, but I think it's worth distinguishing that if we're talking to somebody, because, you know, it's not about blending an argument, but when they say, look, he already called brother Saul, they were Jewish brethren. Right, you know, and, 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 and that's a good point. Uh, because I, I was thinking about that earlier, the, the fact that people make that distinction. Well, well, brother Saul, if you actually go through the use of that word brother, uh, let me see if I can pull it up real quick. Uh, it's used sometimes to refer to Christians, but it's used at other times. Like in Acts chapter 7, uh, by Stephen, when we know clearly he's not before Christians, right? In Acts 7, it, the, the argument again is he's already saved, which we'll get into some arg- uh, evidence that clearly he was not. Uh, but as he comes to him here and he says, Brother Saul, uh, that term, if I'm remembering correctly here, it's used 340 uh, times. Uh, and, 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 and several times it's used to refer to physical brethren or, or uh, having blood relation. For example, Matthew chapter 1, it's used twice. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. There's one of our 340 occurrences. And Josiah, the father of uh, Jeconiah, and his brothers, Matthew 1 and in verse 11. Um, So there are times it's used there uh, to refer to to, uh, physical brothers or physical relation, right? Such as, in this case, actual brothers, as in they had the same same parents. It's the same word used in Acts chapter 7, brothers and fathers, uh, as he addresses them in Acts chapter 7. Are those men Christians? I don't know anybody that would argue they were in Acts chapter 7. Here are clear persecutors of the church who none of them, as opposed to Saul, who's at least waiting to hear what he has to do, none of them have seemed to have a change of heart in Acts 7. In fact, when confronted with the truth, their reaction is, let's stone him, right? And so that term is used there. uh, Same term used when Joseph made himself known to his brothers uh, there as well. So it's used in both terms. How do we determine which one it is? Oftentimes the context will give us an indication. How is he doing it to Saul? Well, let's again go back to remember. Who's been, who are the converts so far? The Jewish people, right? It's the Jewish people. When's our first Gentile convert coming? Acts 10. So at this point, we know Saul is a Jew, right? 
according to Philippians chapter 3, where he argues that uh, if anyone wants to boast in the flesh, I'm more so, right? That he's a Hebrew of the Hebrews, uh, of that he was a Pharisee. Here's a man that's a Jew. What's Ananias? Well, we know he's a Christian, but considering the fact that there hasn't been any Gentile converts yet, we can reach the conclusion very safely he's, of what, he's from what nationality? He's Jewish, also. he's Jewish also. So when he says brother Saul, what's he saying? He's talking about that physical relationship, right? They descended from the 12 tribes, which come from back to those 12 brothers, all descending from Jacob. So that's a good point that we need to understand there of the use of that word. Uh, coming out of question three, coming back to that point that Mike made a moment ago about that term brother, how do we know that it's, uh, how do we know that the term brother is not referring to the fact that he's already a Christian? Well, let's look at some evidence. How do we know that Saul is not already a Christian? Let's, argue, let's answer that argument. Then we answer the question of brother. How, how do we know he's not already a Christian? Question. Yeah. Right. Right. If you if you note in your Bible, verse eighteen, uh, out beside verse eighteen, and immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, he regained his sight. Then he arose and was baptized. If you write in your Bibles, I encourage you write out beside that the passage Mike just mentioned, Acts chapter twenty two and in verse sixteen. Because if somebody says, well, he wasn't saved yet, ask them this question. Can you be saved without calling on the name of the Lord? Okay. Now, what's the answer you're going to get? Most likely. Well, can you be saved without calling on his name? They'll say no, but the question is, how are you calling on his name? Right. How do we know we call on his name? According to scriptures, Acts 22, 16, Acts 2, 38. How do we do that? Through baptism, right? And why do you wait to rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord? How does a religious world say we call on His name? Just by saying, Lord, Lord. But not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says, I'm not one who wishes to have Now, refute that. And also, I know we've already studied it, Michael, but Acts 22 21, when he was talking about the cross, he was in gold, he said, And it shall come to pass, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Go one down three sermons, men and brethren, what shall we do? He said, Well, man, and be baptized. You know, he didn't say, uh -huh. he back there in Acts 10 20. Right. You know what I mean? So it just kind of further solidifies the point. Right. So, so let's go back here and think about this in a broad picture. You're talking with somebody and they say, Well, Saul was already converted on the road to Damascus. Okay. How are we saved? I think we'll all agree, no matter what people believe as to how, we'll all agree that you have to call on the name of the Lord, right? The only question that we have is, that differs is, how do we do such a thing? Do we actually just call out, or is it through baptism? Now, let's go back to the New Testament, Acts 22, 16. Acts 2, 21, along with verse 38. Again, we've still got the charts in the back where we've got it separated out. We went through that in Acts 2. Uh, as we looked at the, at, at the terminology used in verse 21 and verse 38, and it parallels the terminology. You know, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, let every one of you be baptized. Uh, calling on the name of the Lord, repent and be baptized. So that you, those that call on the name of the Lord will be saved. You're, you're forgiven of your sins. And the parallel terms used, and not the exact same phrases, but the parallel terms used that help us there in Acts chapter uh, 2 to see that term along with 22.16, that that's how your sins are forgiven. We know your sins are forgiven is when you call on the name of the Lord, right? According to 22.16, we know baptism is how your sins are forgiven, right? In Acts chapter 2. So when we put all these together, what's the conclusion we have to come to? When's he saved? After he's baptized, right? And so Acts 22, 16, that's why I say, if you don't note that out beside uh, in your Bible, you need to call on the name of the Lord. That's how it's done, is through uh, baptism. Now, let's consider this as well. If Saul is already a Christian, he is the most miserable Christian. Because I want you to think about his reaction. If he's saved, Ananias gets there and he's baptized. What's Ananias doing when Saul gets there? He's still waiting, right? Here, here's a man uh, coming down now uh, in, in verse number uh, 17. Ananias departed and entered and laying his hands on Saul. Uh, he found Saul there. Or uh, Let's back on up. Uh, verse 9, he was without sight, neither ate nor drank. He's just sort of sitting there uh, waiting 
till Ananias comes. Because what did Jesus tell him on the road to Damascus? Go to, the, go to this house in Damascus, and there it will be told to you what he needed to do to be saved, right? So what is Saul's mindset at this point? What does Saul know that he's not? He knows he's not saved, right? And so, uh, if Saul's already converted on the road to Damascus, he's the most miserable Christian we read of in Scriptures. Because even though he's saved, he's acting like he's not, if that's the case. So, aside from the fact that we can come and see the evidence, he had to be baptized in order to be saved. If he's already a Christian, uh, then uh, he's feeling pretty miserable for somebody that's been forgiven of sins, right? Here at the end of the text. Uh, why was Ananias in We talked about this some on Sunday with the eunuch. Why does Ananias have to go to Saul? Why is he sent? What's he telling him when he gets there? What does Saul need to know that he doesn't know before Ananias comes? What he has to do to be saved, right? And uh, same reason the eunuch had to be taught by Philip, same reason later on, uh, Peter's going to have to go to the household of Cornelius. He does not know yet what he has to do to be saved. Does he know he needs to be saved? Yes. But he doesn't know what he has to do. Well, why doesn't the Lord just tell him on the road to Damascus? We mentioned this on Sunday morning. Why not just tell him? Right? Well, who's got the responsibility of teaching the gospel? New Testament Christians have that responsibility of teaching the gospel. Uh, again, we mentioned it on Sunday morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, uh, verse 7. We have this treasure. What's the treasure of 2 Corinthians 4, 7? It's the gospel in earthen vessels, right? Again, I think the earthen vessels is the apostles and not all of us. But either it's all of us, all New Testament Christians, or if it is the apostles, and here are those that walk with Christ in their earthen vessels, then what does that make us, right? And the point is that he makes there is that it's in earthen vessels. Kind of like we used the illustration the other day. Why do you buy a jar of peanut butter? To eat, right? You don't buy a jar of peanut butter because you love the Jif jar or whatever brand of peanut butter you use. You buy it for the contents. And so, as we mentioned the other day, what if an angel had just gone and talked to the eunuch? What if Saul had just heard on the road? To, or, well, Saul would have heard from Jesus himself, so that would be a little bit different. But he needed to hear from, from a person because they needed to realize the power was in the Word, right? To which they obeyed. Because we could have an angel appear before us and teach us right now. What are we going to be amazed by? Let's be honest with ourselves. If an angel was standing right here, right now, behind the podium teaching us, how many of us are focused on what he's saying, and how many of us are going to be amazed at the fact that there's an angel standing behind the podium talking to us? Right? Our focus is probably going to be on the fact that, wow, there's an angel standing there at the podium. Right? We're probably not going to focus a whole lot on what's said. The point of the treasure in earthen vessels is, where's our focus need to be? It needs to be on the gospel itself. Yes. Right, you know, that, that's a good point. Good point as well. Come now down into question number uh, five now. We'll read 19 uh, and 20 again, or 19 again. And taking uh, food, he was strengthened for some days. He was with the disciples at Damascus. Backing up into what we saw in the previous verses, what all does Saul have to do to be saved? Not just mentioned in this text, okay? We know there, there are some other things mentioned uh, in other passages, but what do we know that he had to do to be saved? And how do we know he had to do all those things? So first, what, what did he have to do? He had to hear the Word of God. He had to believe it. He had to confess his faith. He had to repent of his sins, and he had to be baptized, right? We can see some of that here in this text, verse 18. Again, we put a lot of the other accounts. Uh, we know he had to repent, Acts 17, 30, and 31. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands who to repent? All men everywhere to repent. Uh, 
Uh, we know he had faith. It talks about in several passages and all these other things. Why did, why, how do we know he had to do all those things? Even though they're not all mentioned in this text. How do we know he had to do every single one of those? We're told that in different areas, but not only are we told it in different areas. Think about a passage in Romans chapter 2. Saul, Saul, you could look at Saul and say, well, isn't Saul a different case? Because Saul's going to be an apostle, right? Well, according to Romans 2 and verse 11, God shows no partiality. All right, so even though he was an apostle, what did he have to do? Exactly what you and I have to do today. Yeah, yes. Uh, in fact, that's shown. Uh, go ahead. Question seven. Uh, what, what does Paul do as soon as he's converted? He, he's teaching, right? Uh, after all this takes place, and immediately, verse 20, he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue. Uh, here's somebody. It, it, it's on so many fronts, the story of Saul of Tarsus or the Apostle Paul, uh, from the conversion here into the end. Here's a man. I mean, you think about it. Uh, we, we brought this up before. Did Saul of Tarsus think what he was doing in chapters uh, 7, 8, and the first part of 9 was right? Did he think it was right? Yes. Right? He said in Acts 23, he lived in all good conscience before God until that day. Well, he thought, <coughs> excuse me, he thought what he was doing was right. Now, he was wrong, but he was sincere in what he was doing. Right? Here's a man on fire for what he thinks is right, and he's in opposition to Christ. And then he learns the truth. And as soon as he learns the truth, he's over here on the complete, op- I mean, just a, con- a complete turnaround, and he's on fire for the Lord now in teaching his word. And that's where we find him here in verses 20 uh, through 22. He's teaching them. By the way, as a quick note, our time's uh, quickly getting away from us. Uh, he immediately proclaimed them. He said in verse, tw- in verse 21, here's the people's reaction. Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem, the, those who... Called upon his name. Verse 22. Saul increased all the more in strength. He confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. But it, it comes and mentions here. He had to call on the name of the Lord to be saved, right? Acts 22. And then here's this man teaching others that Jesus is the Christ. And the people are amazed because here's this man who was in opposition to them, who was persecuting those who called on the name of the Lord. And now he's teaching that you need to do what? Call on the name of the Lord. Right, And so, what a, what a change we see here in Saul of Tarsus. Uh, we'll pick up in verse 23. Uh, we're all going to Jerusalem on Sunday morning.